evening, and welcome to This Is Your Life. No, you're, you're not seeing doubles. Actor Alan Page here is playing the part of a television reporter. And he's got to join the crowd of other actors in a moment here who are filming outside the Wembley Studios of London Weekend Television. They're waiting for one more person who's due to arrive any second now. What he doesn't know is that I'm going to play the part of the reporter for this scene anyway, not Alan. Thank you, Alan. And now, just before he arrives, would you like a peep inside the book? That's him when he made his first film. And if you don't recognize him now, you will in a moment because I see his car arriving. I've got to mix with the crowd now, so let's see what happens. <laughs> I just want to tell you one thing because tonight, Dickie Henderson, star on both sides of the Atlantic, this is your life. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, I oh, you <laughs> oh, boy, this is too much. Yep. Well, how about Well, oh, Dickie, that scene that I gate crashed, you know, was uh, the filming for the, your new television series, which we're going to see very soon. <laughs> I, that's frightened the life out of me, I can tell you. <laughs> I must say, I was so thrilled when I saw you in that makeup that I paid you the pound I owed you for the cup final last year, the last time I saw you. <laughs> you did, too. Served your right to take lead. <laughs> right. <laughs> Dickie Henderson, this is your life. Now, your late father, Dick Henderson, was a famous comedian in his day. Your mother, a soubrette. As a child of ten, you're acting in Hollywood movies. But your pathway to stardom was not always easy. One night, 14 years ago, you think that you've reached the summit with the Royal Variety Show at the London Palladium. Instead, you end up flat on the floor. How'd you fancy another brandy and coat, man? <laughs> <laughs> You'd never guess who that is. Come Harry, in, Harry, Harry Cecil. <laughs> Tell me, why did Dickie here hit the floor then? Well, it was uh, back in 1956. I can remember it as if it was only 14 years ago. Sorry, <laughs> lad. <laughs> and um, it was a command performance, actually. And uh, we are on the same show. You see, that's we've been booked together as a double act. And uh, we weren't really. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're all set to go, all keyed up, ready to go in the theatre all day. And then suddenly they, we found out that uh, the show had been cancelled because of the Hungarian crisis and the Suez crisis. The Queen had called it off. And we rehearsed everything except the audience. <laughs> so, uh, very upset. So we decided to go to my dressing room because I was in the theatre at the time at the Palladium. You know, yeah. and I had all the drink ready for afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we might as well go in there and uh, console ourselves for a dozen of us. There's myself, Dickie here, uh, Eric Sykes, Sabrina. She took up another room in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> we found us some drinks on her. <laughs> she was a lovely table. And uh, I introduced her to brandy and coke. There was not much of a drinker, you see, but uh, he's a good consoler. <laughs> and he consoled himself rigid. <laughs> right. So we finished, we flattened his back. So was I. Anyway, we did the show again a year later. It was just as well because it took him a year to get over the hangover. Right. Uh, that's <laughs> tricky. Seconds before we met this evening, I showed viewers a picture of you as a ten-year-old in oh, Hollywood. Uh, we have it here somewhere. Tell me, what was the name of the... <laughs> what, what was the movie you appeared in then, Dickie? Uh, Cavalcade. Cavalcade it was, yes. yes. And I'd like you to take yeah. a look at a clip from Cavalcade and tell me, in this scene, whether you think you would recognize your <laughs> old pal from all these years. Just watch it here now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. And Edward. And that's not, Dickie. I better explain. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. Oh, no, no, no. I don't know. Here, Edith. Here's your piece. <laughs> <laughs> that one. That's not my piece. Yes, it is. It is not. <laughs> well, Harry, would you recognize Dickie? <laughs> I'm going to try. 
Would you recognize him? Yes, he was a bit of a job, but uh, you know, he doesn't wear those high hats and long dresses anymore, does he? <laughs> All right, thank you, Harry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, Rubo. Ah. Our film project, he was in 1933. Came while you were living in California where your father was working in vaudeville. You stayed in America for three years because your father wanted you near him when he was working. But there was one night you went missing. The San Francisco police had a dragnet out for him. Yes, they have. That's your mother, Mrs. Winnie Henderson. She's here tonight with her sister, sometimes your second mother, now 83, Mrs. Mary Kelly. Uh -huh. and there's your sister. Uh, Mrs. Henderson, telling us about this next one, Mary, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> when you had this dragnet out in San Francisco, you did get Dickie back eventually, didn't you? Yes. Where did you find him? Well, I found him outside the Golden Gate Theater. In San, in Francisco. San Francisco. And I heard this voice. I thought, I'm sure that's a voice I know. And, of course, it was, uh, it was my son. Well, what was the voice saying? Uh, papers. <laughs> <laughs> How did he come to be selling papers? Well, I went up to him and I said, what are you supposed to be doing? He said, well, I've just um, taken over, he said, for the paper man. <laughs> so I said, well, you better, I hope he comes back quickly, I said, because I have a meal waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got him back. And after that part in Cavalcade, Dickie's father refused other film offers for his son because he firmly believed that child stars lost all sense of proper value. So he brought Dickie back to London to go to school, and that's where you come in, Mrs. Kelly. Because when Dickie's parents were away in pantomime, you come down from Liverpool to look after your nephew. Was he an easy boy to look after? Yes, but he was very boisterous. <laughs> very boisterous. Just one time I found something that cured him of that. What did you find? Bath bombs. Bath bombs. <laughs> <laughs> so what effect did they have on him? Quietened him for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I think you brought some down today, didn't yes, you? Yes, I remembered, and I bought some, brought some with me today. That's Would you what like you've been telling oh. Not now. You can give it to him later. <laughs> <laughs> the school that your father sent you to, Dickie, was St. Joseph's <laughs> College in South London, but he doesn't save you from the stage. At Easter in 1934, you take part in the school passion play. Oh, Do yeah. you remember the part you played? Oh, I remember. Well, well. Take, take a look at a picture we have here, and. Uh, Good. On the left there, that's Punch's pilot. You're the boy on the right. When we saw that picture, we set out to trace him, and we did. He may have been a Hollywood film actor, but he was shaking with stage fright. He's now an officer with the Ministry of Education. You haven't seen him for 36 years. Come in, Michael Barry. <laughs> Thirty-seven, Michael. Oh, thirty-seven. <laughs> Anyhow, it's quite clear from what you said, Michael, there, that Dickie wasn't quite so cool on stage in those days. No, he nearly ruined the scene. <laughs> he was trembling so much, he upset half the bowl of water all over me. That's right. <laughs> and my toga was soaking wet for the rest of the play. <laughs> You've never forgotten it. It didn't do very much for the dignity of Pontius Pilate. Yeah. Did I you got a rollicking, too. Did, yeah. But did you know that he was supposed to be a seasoned Hollywood performer? No. <laughs> Little boys were rather beneath our notice in this form. <laughs> <laughs> I got a very bad odor, I know, with the director. In fact, yes, in fact I, didn't, I didn't know until you told me recently that it was the same Dickie Henderson I like to see on television nowadays. Yes, I must right. say, you improved tremendously. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Barry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, at 16, Dickie, you leave school and take a job as prop boy with the late Jack Hilton's band. You're determined on the stage career, even though your father has warned you it'll be tough. And it is tough. You've got many setbacks. Promise bookings that don't happen, shows that fold before they get to the West End or just run a few nights, auditions you don't pass, a royal variety show cancelled, the death of your first wife. But at 18, with the glitter of stars in your eyes, you launch out with your first solo act. You've taught yourself eccentric dancing. Oh, God. Now, what is eccentric dancing, Vicky? Eccentric dancing? Yeah. Well, it's uh, leg mania. It's just the thing you don't see. <laughs> <laughs> come on, show us what it is. Come on, let's see what it is. Come on, let's see. Come on. What can you do? I mean, you got to go like that. I need a bone. Indeed, I'm sure some of you are hard to believe this, having watched that. But having watched that, let me tell you, that a famous band leader is so impressed by that, 
that he booked Sticky for, of all things, a radio show. His own radio show. Do you remember who that was? <clears throat> Henry it was. That's right, Henry Hall. Henry Hall. One of the great impresarios. Now, Henry, at this very moment, is on his way to America on a cruise. But before he went, he too remembered this occasion. Ah, uh -huh. Henry Hall speaking. And tonight, I am your guest. I, of course, can remember way back when you were a skinny young lad doing your wonderful dancing act at the Palace in Chelsea. I remember also your first broadcast with me in 1940, 1953. You did your first television, and you were a principal comedian for me in the summer show at Ramsgate. I think perhaps I remember you best of all when you were appearing in a broadcast for me at the Odeon, uh, it was in Ipswich, and your father was on the same program, and he did that wonderful dance of his to tiptoe through the tulips. He had an enormous reception, and you were so proud of him. You really were. And Dickie, tonight, I think he would have been enormously proud of you. Congratulations. Dickie, it's some years later that you star in your own television series. And one day during rehearsals in December 1963, you invite the production assistant on your series to lunch at the Waldorf. While you're there, she hits you in the eye with a lemon. <laughs> right? With the juice of a lemon. The juice of a lemon. <laughs> but despite that, she later becomes Mrs. Dickie Henderson. Come in, uh, win it. <laughs> You, you better tell us, Gwyneth, what happened at that lunch, will you? Yes, well, we uh, hadn't known Dickie very long, and uh, he was our first date. He invited me to lunch, very polite, very charming. And uh, I remember ordering um, smoked salmon, put the fork in the lemon to squeeze over the salmon, and I squeezed it all over Dickie. <laughs> uh, we laughed our way out of that one. But I believe there's one uh, situation that uh, you didn't laugh your way out of quite so easily. No, well, Dickie's very keen on golf, and so after we were married, I took it up. But the first time I hit a ball from the golf tee, it landed two inches from the hole. It was a mistake I didn't make again. <laughs> <laughs> but I gather now, anyway, that the pair of you are a formidable twosome on the golf course. Yeah. Where will I join them? <laughs> <laughs> it's a foursome. <laughs> <laughs> it's love it. <laughs> I think I wanted to take you back a little bit uh, from your exploits on the golf course to another kind of course, an army assault course. It's 1942, and as Lieutenant Richard Henderson of the Royal Army Service Corps. You're in charge of creating realistic battle conditions for troops in training. And that was when he did another eccentric dance with his trousers at half mast. The man who was your senior officer, come in, Peter Ike. Peter! <laughs> Tell us what happened that day on the uh, well, assault course. <laughs> Dickie was in charge of the operation as usual and making a very good job of it. Thank you. One of the things he used to do was run along at the assault force throwing thunder flashes and uh, smoke bombs with the troops to make it appear more realistic. However, on this particular day, he still had three thunder flashes left in his buttonless glove pocket. <laughs> And a spark must have ignited one of them, which in turn ignited the others, and bang! Half his trousers were blown off, <laughs> and the remainder were hanging down against his knees. And there he stood in the middle of the assault course, a lonely figure, doing his usual impromptu eccentric <laughs> Thank you, Peter Wright. <laughs> Well, in 1946, you come out of army uniform and back into grease paint. Five more years of touring and building up her act learned you, earned you a booking at the London Palladium. You've now hit the jackpot, but you're not sure you're ready for it yet. Backstage, you pace up and down, back and forth, trying to master the courage to share your worries with another artist on that same bill. They're already playing the overture as you tap nervously on his dressing room door. I thought, who the hell is that knocking on my door when I'm putting my makeup on? <laughs> How did you manage, Ted, to uh, uh, get rid of his worries on that particular night? Well, nobody plays the play to me without being worried. <laughs> I'll tell you. And the boy's first time, he, knocks him, he came and I said, well, who are you? He said, I'm Dickie Henderson. I said, well, we all have our trouble. 
I said, what's the matter, Swan? I knew your father very well, great comic. He said, well, Ted, I'm a bit nervous. I said, well, we all are. And then I realized that he wanted a little advice. And I said, Dickie, when you walk out there tonight, remember, there's not one living person in that audience that can dance like you do, who can tell jokes like you do, do impressions like you do, do the, uh, you remember? Yeah. <laughs> like you do. <laughs> So remember, Dickie, I said, you're the governor. Go out there and kill him. And he killed him. Did he? Ah. He did. <laughs> in Thank fact, you. he was so good. I was fifth spot in the second half and found a hell of a job following him. <laughs> and I tell you something, I found a hell of a job ever since yeah. on the golf course. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Thank you, Ted Ray. Yes. Can you? Yes, of course. Keep me on. Yes, gotcha. Dickie, keep me on. I've got it. that was. No, no. The silvery moon. Oh, no. No, no, no. No, I couldn't do it. <laughs> the greatest thing, uh, greatest ad lib oh, I've ever oh. heard on stage was by Ted mm. on the second house of the first night. Because the first show, they switched the program because the top of the bill, whom should be nameless, <laughs> didn't do too well. So they I'm switched the program. <laughs> <laughs> they switched the program so Ted yes. closed the bill. And he had to follow a, a pianist Color pianist by the name of Hazel Scott, Hazel Scott who stopped right. the show so cold it was ridiculous. <laughs> you know, those that were. This is our up. life, Dickie. This is our life. Yes, bless him. And he had a follower, and the people were cheering, and flowers were coming up, and those that weren't crying were reaching for digitalis. <laughs> but he stood on the side. He couldn't come on because he couldn't follow. <laughs> Suddenly, he burst through the curtain and said to the audience. I heard you calling for me, but I couldn't get here any quicker. <laughs> for the second time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the greatest ad lib I've ever heard. Ted. <laughs> well, I know Ted gave you advice that night. Your father gave you lots of advice. What was the most important piece of advice your father ever gave you? Oh, my father gave me such good advice. He was a great man with a great philosophy on life, uh, show business-wise. I think the greatest advice he ever gave me was respect your audience and they've paid their money to either like you or be rude to you, so get on with it. That's it. Well, that's very important advice, but another bit of very sound advice that I know you follow is never to take hard liquor before a show. Oh. He prefers the taste of wine anyway. And even then it's only wine gums. The answer is that buy you wine gums when you forget them. Your son and daughter, Matthew <laughs> and Linda <laughs> Linda, you're 16 now, but when people, when you were much younger, asked you, you know, what your dad did for a living, what did you tell them? I used to say he falls down. That's all I ever saw him do. <laughs> but now, of course, you know how versatile he is. Yes, it's easier to tell them what he doesn't do. <laughs> <laughs> well, your father chews wine gums before a show to keep his nerves steady, I gather. I know you brought a packet of wine gums from him. couldn't give them to him without tipping off the secret. Why don't you give them to him now? No, I can't. Why not? <laughs> well, he's so nervous. We ate them before he came here. Thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. In 1957, you land the plum job of regular compare of the television show Sunday Night at the London Palladium. The same year, just 12 months after your disappointment in 1956, you appear in your first Royal Variety Show. Also that same year, you open in review at the Prince of Wales. Everything is going wonderfully well. Then suddenly, you're confined to bed for four weeks, all because of something your son Matthew there has done to you. What was that? He gave me mumps. Yes, that's right. <laughs> That's right, and because of this, someone is after your blood, literally. <laughs> I descended on him at midnight, like a vampire. It's not Count Dracula, it is in fact your good friend, Brian Rick. Brian Rick. <laughs> Tell us, why did you want Dickie's blood? Well, my daughter had gone down with mumps, and I'd never had them. And uh, as I was appearing in uh, theatre fast at the time, and also uh, rehearsing for telly, I hadn't got time to laze around like Dickie was doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, was told by my doctor the only way I could possibly avoid mumps was to have uh, 30 cc's of blood from somebody who just uh, recovered. I um, immediately thought of Dickie. And I phoned him up. And he said yes right away. Oh, well, no. First of all, he fainted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when he recovered, he said yes. So um, I went round around midnight with my doctor to his dressing room. 
and we started this transfusion. <laughs> and as I say, it was 30 cc's of blood, but unfortunately my doctor had only brought along a 10 cc syringe, which is a lot smaller. And so he put the needle into Dickie's arm, and he uh, extracted 10 cc's of blood. In the meantime, I was on the other side of the dressing room, <laughs> over a sofa, and I... <laughs> Um, my trousers were down by my ankles, and he came over to me and he put a dart in my, um, how's your father? And gave me 10 cc's of blood. He then walked over to Dickie, and he proceeded to remove another 10 cc's of blood, and came over to me, and I was like, well, well, by now this had got all around the theatre. And they were queuing at the stage door, at the, at the dressing room door, to get in, to see this marvellous sight. And I've never seen so many actresses uh, falling about with laughter at this particular scene. But I can assure you, it's the one occasion where certainly when uh, I dropped my trousers, Dickie didn't laugh. <laughs> but as far as I was concerned, I had the last laugh because I didn't get mumped. Uh, Thank you very much, Charles. Another strong tie between Brian and yourself is that he, like Harry Seacombe, is the past chairman of the Stars Organization for Spastics. You are the present chairman, and only last week you went down on a trip to the center at Wake Hall in Colchester to visit some of your friends there. <laughs> And what you didn't know was that it was our camera that was filming you. And as well as the spastic, Dickie, one of the places you used to visit was Queen Mary's Children's Hospital at Kershaw, where golf professional Harry Wheatman's daughter was being treated for polio. Harry feared she would never walk again, but things started to look a bit brighter for her when you took an interest. She's here tonight to tell us how you helped her. Come in, Jay Wheatman. Oh. Jay, you told us that Dickie helped you to walk again. He's not a medical man. What did he do? No, it wasn't just me. It was all of us. He came and he kept made us laugh, and um, he gave us the will to keep on trying. And well, we used to keep on improving, and we thought we were letting him down if we didn't. And there was something else he was able to do for you outside hospital, wasn't yes, it? Yes, he found we needed special coaches to go down to the seaside and take day trips. So he got together with Leslie McDonnell and the Variety Club. And they came up with the Sunshine Coaches, which are now being sent to children's hospitals all over the world. And on behalf of them, and everyone who's benefited from it, I say thank you. Well, I'm sure being here tonight is all the thank you we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. After the Prince of Wales review, you commute regularly across the Atlantic where you make dozens of appearances on American TV and also play a three-month cabaret season in the famous Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. Among your many friends in America, there's one in particular who wanted to be here tonight to congratulate you as he did once before. But he's working right now in the cowboy capital, Oklahoma City. But he climbed off his horse long enough to talk to you now. Cowboy star, Dale Robertson. Hi, Dickie. Been about, say, maybe 16 years since I came to London. And there, for the third time, went to see Tea House the August Moon. But after watching you do it, I realized I'd never really seen it before. And I did something that night I've never done before or since. Let's go backstage and congratulate a performance done by an actor. We've been friends ever since. And I look forward to the times when you come to the States and stay with us at our house. And we'll put on the cowboy regalia and go out and ride the horses and play cowboy and Englishman. <laughs> and afterwards, when we go to play golf, sometimes I win. Always you got the same excuse. You just can't play golf when you're sad. <laughs> Good luck to you, Dickie, on your new TV show. Remember, they ain't tall in the saddle. <laughs> Thank you, Dale Robertson. <laughs> I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to go over there. I'm 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 going to go over there. And one night I knocked him out. Your two co-stars from that series come in, Joan Laverick and Lionel Merton. <laughs> How come you knocked him out? Oh, well, you see, um, one of the strips that we did called, called for me to 
slapped Dickie across the face. I was supposed to be furious and hit him really hard. But Dickie kept saying to me, Sally, he doesn't look real. Go on, you know, if I give up. Oh, <laughs> oh, dear, I made it look real all right. I hit him so hard. Poor <laughs> I deafened him completely. You were, as I remember it, you were lip reading her apology. <laughs> Thank you, Lana Murphy and Jude Lover. Thank you. Well, Dickie, we've seen you as a performer whose versatility covers just about every sphere of show business. You've won yourself fans of all ages in Britain and America, but there's one fan of yours who was born in Bangkok. She's someone I know who will never forget that she co starred with you on your last television series. Uh, Come in, Minnie. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's not only got bananas, he's got Aunt Mary's bath buns. My dear. Before you see that elephant, Dickie Henderson, what a pleasure to say. This is your life. <laughs> thank you very much. 